Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to welcome to this uh, director's colloquium of the Research School of Physics and Engineering. Uh, this week, uh, it will actually be not only a joint uh, seminar with the Australian Institute of Physics, as it normally is, uh, but also with the ANU Energy Change Institute. And I see a number of people in the audience from various parts of the university who have an energy interest uh, as well. And that is because uh, today we are uh, privileged to have uh, as our director's colloquium speaker, Professor Barry Brook. Uh, Barry uh, is from the University of Adelaide where he holds the Sir Hubert Wilkins chair. And for those of you who don't know who Sir Hubert Wilkins is, he is Australia's, and the world's indeed, last great explorer. He was an aviator. Uh, who back in the 20s and 30s was the first person to fly over both the Antarctic and the Arctic. And uh, he is a person who uh, deserves greater recognition than uh, history has left him. But uh, it is well recognised at Adelaide University where there is the Sir Hubert Wilkins chair which Barry holds. So Barry's uh, background uh, is in uh, statistics and in modelling. Uh, he is an interest in stochastic modelling processes for a range of applications uh, including uh, uh, biological and, uh, and physical, and this has uh, brought him into the uh, area of energy where these uh, types of models are important for I introducing and understanding the way that different energy sources link into the grid. And so this has led to uh, his uh, developed uh, expertise in, in this particular area of energy research and, uh, and has also led to an interest in uh, how in uh, many different uh, forms of energy uh, there are issues relating to uh, the connectivity and the stability of the, of the electricity network. And this has further led to another interest in nuclear power, and uh, that's uh, what we'll be hearing about today from Barry, which is Advanced Nuclear Power Systems for Long-Term Energy and Climate Security. So would you please join with me in welcoming Professor Barry Brook. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here to talk to you about uh, this topic today, one of my passions. Um, I'm really fundamentally interested in how we move away as a society from fossil fuels and looking at all of the potential energy options that might be available to us and evaluating them uh, logically and, uh, and fairly so that we can have our best uh, possible chance of displacing coal, oil and gas at the sort of time frames that are required to address major problems like climate change. Now, energy is fundamentally at the heart of a problem like climate change. You could almost describe climate change as a symptom of the energy problem we now face, which is that since the dawn of the industrial era, we've used more and more, uh, we've come to rely more and more on fossil fuels, primarily to drive our energy systems and therefore to drive our economies and our technology, our modern civilization. So energy has formed the basis of our ability to to grow hugely in population, uh, to grow in technological status, but also it has these impacts on the environment, which we've always been aware of, but I think are now becoming more acutely magnified. And this includes coal, which is usually used to generate uh, stationary electricity, oil and gas, which are more often deployed uh, in transport. Now, one of the manifestations of combusting these fossil fuels is the rising concentration of various greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, as is illustrated on this slide over here. We have carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide. These are what are fundamentally uh, causing the problem now in terms of uh, amplifying the amount of heat that's trapped in the atmosphere, so the amount of energy. So climate change is an important contextual problem for this because it provides a motivation for rapid transition away from fossil fuels rather than something that might otherwise occur on a more leisurely pace if we weren't particularly concerned about these sort of problems. I mean, ultimately, I think no one can disagree that we do have to move away from these finite energy sources to energy sources that are essentially uh, inexhaustible, be that renewable energy or various other types of nuclear energy such as uh, recycled fission energy or fusion. Uh, but the time frames are compressed when you're thinking about how quickly climate change impacts may become significant and uh, also the ability for us to continue to supply fossil fuels like oil at the rate they're being consumed. 
So climate change is not the topic of this talk, but it is an important context for the rate of deployment that I think is required. Now, of course, if we try and go down the pathway of assigning responsibility for climate change, then there are any number of ways we can look at this problem. Uh, somewhere like China, which is a hugely populous nation, rapidly industrialising, is now responsible for more greenhouse gases being emitted per year than any other country. But on a per capita basis, countries like Australia and the US far outstrip the developing world. So there are different responsibilities there. If you want to look at the total amount of carbon dioxide emitted since the Industrial Revolution, then Britons are most responsible for what is resident in the atmosphere. Ultimately, though, the underpinning of solutions to large and growing economies like China or developed economies like Australia will be a transition to alternative energy forms. And so the choice we then face in the climate change context is not that we're going to avoid future climate change. I think uh, a lot of that is already locked in. Uh, but that by applying policy, we can choose which roulette wheel, if you like, for the future we can spin to minimise the risks we face in the future. The longer we delay and the less active we are in employing these alternative technologies, the more likely there is of damaging problems. So we have a challenging energy future ahead of us. Now, one of the challenging realities is the situation we find ourselves in today. We're not at a situation where we have all of these options available to us. We can start from scratch and we can construct what we consider the ideal system. We have a large legacy of electricity and transport systems that will need replacement. And the legacy is illustrated here uh, for electricity generation for a number of major economies. So we have China over here, United States, OECD Europe, and then various other smaller countries, including Australia over here. Now, red is coal. So you can see coal is still a really integral component for electricity generation in many countries. Yellow is gas, and dark blue is oil. So oil is still used in some countries like Japan for a fair amount of electricity generation. Green is nuclear and blue is hydroelectricity. So there's two things to get out of a chart like this. One is that fossil fuels still dominate and so displacing those will be a major challenge. The other one is that there have been two forms of non-fossil energy historically that have taken a large share of the load in various countries and that's large dams and nuclear fission. Now when you try and speculate on what the future of energy will be, uh, we, you know, we can look back at the past and say this is what is, when we try and determine what may be, there's a huge amount of disagreement and this is where the debate around energy uh, really is, is magnified. The different interests and different uh, technology experts and different agendas have very different visions for the future. So if you see a projection from um, a coal company, it may include a large amount of coal in the future. If you see one from the World Nuclear Association, such as on the right there, then a large amount of nuclear. Really hard to determine which one of those will be most realistic, but we can look at some fundamental principles to give us at least a guideline. So let's look at where nuclear power, which is the main topic of today's talk, uh, sits today. Nuclear is deployed commercially in many countries around the world. Over 30 now get some fraction of their electricity from nuclear power and they're coloured there in dark blue and in light blue for those that are uh, planning new reactors and also have operating reactors. But of course there are many countries that don't currently have nuclear power, especially the less developed countries economically and almost uniquely in a developed country, Australia. Most of those nuclear power plants that were built in those countries shown in the previous slide were built 20, 30 years ago. And there really hasn't been much new deployment of nuclear power in the last 10 to 15 years. Uh, if we look at where new nuclear power plants are being built today, the predominance of them is in Asia and mostly in China, around 43%, an increasing amount in India and other places like South Korea and Japan. Although Japan's obviously now having that dialogue about what their energy future will be. Russia is also building new nuclear capacity, but OECD, Europe, Australia, US, really not much is happening today. Now it's important to understand that like any technology, nuclear power today is not the same type of technology 
in detail that it was, say, 30 or 40 years ago. I mean, fundamentally, it operates on the same sort of principles, but technology develops. So if we consider the problems faced at the reactors at Fukushima Daiichi after the tsunami and earthquake struck, then we do need to consider many factors, the type of technology, the age of the technology, the siting of the technology, in trying to understand what the fundamental causes of the accident were and therefore its implications. So I understand Aidan Byrne has given a talk previously on Fukushima and I won't go into details on it here, but this was clearly an example of a technology that under duress uh, failed to meet uh, the standards that the public expected and so has been a major uh, public image problem for nuclear power and if you have too many of those public image problems then nuclear power won't progress, it won't be accepted as an alternative. What would replace it is more a matter of debate. <clears throat> to date it's been fossil fuels that for instance Japan has shut down many of its reactors temporarily and bought in more coal and gas. Now the type of technology that was deployed at Fukushima Daiichi was designed in the mid 60s, built in the early to mid 70s. It's considered the early stages of Generation 2 technology. Generation 1 being the very first commercialised type reactors, such as Shipping Port in, in the US and the Magnox reactors in Britain. Generation 2 was a large build out in the 60s and 70s. Today we tend to be building Generation 3 and Generation 3 plus reactors. So the Fukushima Daiichi reactors are around a 1970s vintage technology. And lots obviously been learnt since the General Electric Mark I reactor and similar types were built. And a lot of that has actually focused on recognising the problems that occurred at Fukushima Daiichi and ensuring that systems are in place to try and avoid vulnerability to those sort of problems such as extended station blackout. So the type of reactor technology that are being deployed today in places like China are generation 3 and 3 plus and these are systems that put more emphasis on what are called passive safety where it requires fewer engineered systems and more systems based on the laws of physics in order to operate. As well as uh, trying to improve the economics by having a more standardised type of uh, build um, that could be factory produced at least in components and therefore bring down costs. And this is an example of one of the new technologies that's being deployed. A number of these are planned to be built in the US in the next few years. Four of them are currently being built in China. This is called the Westinghouse AP1000 reactor. And just to give you an example of one of its uh, passive safety technologies, its cooling water is contained in a tank in the roof of the containment building and so when there's a station blackout conditions it's able to feed into the reactor vessels via gravity and then convection allows it to cool through the walls and re-pool at the top and so this produces a natural cooling loop that can be maintained for three to five days which would have been sufficient for the Daiichi reactors to ride through the, the station blackout that they experienced. So it, the new builds that are occurring in nuclear uh, are focused in the east rather than in uh, the traditional areas where nuclear power has been deployed and they're the generation three technology which are considered evolutionary improvement on the previous generation of technology, Generation 2. There are families of technology which are arguably revolutionary changes in the technology because they do things fundamentally very differently and that will be the topic of much of the rest of this talk. But first I'll consider something intermediate between those two and this is called Generation 3 plus plus. So it's sort of an increment on from the best we're building today uh, but still not generation 4 because generation 4 involves a range of technologies that involve uh, very different assumptions about how nuclear power works. So generation 3 plus plus technologies are often called small modular reactors. So they're sitting at the deployment schedule of around 2020, 2025 um, and there's interest in them in many countries. This is an example of one of the technologies that's likely to reach commercialisation within the next few years, the Babcock and Wilcox M-Power reactor. Now this is a, a light water reactor, so it's similar in that sense to the sort of reactors that have been built for the last 40 or 50 years commercially. It's around the size of a large aircraft carrier reactor, 125 megawatts electric. It provides a number of unique safety features that um, allow it to 
cool itself down, it can be built below ground and these are sometimes called nuclear batteries because they can be run over long burn up periods so you don't need to change the fuel very often and in this case for this reactor the fuel would have to be changed every, every uh, 20 years or so and it would all be stored on site. Uh, the difficulty in deploying these has been an economic argument that in order to make these cost effective you ha really have to build lots of them but in order to build lots of them, you have to build the first few, and so you have to have people willing to invest in that. But this may well be the way Australia enters the nuclear energy market, if and when it does so, because uh, it allows for an incremental adding on of power generation to an existing grid in, in quite a sensible way. So the idea might be to have a single plug and play unit that then could be added incrementally to a site over time as needs developed or as financing was available so that multiple 125 megawatt units would eventually build up to a large power station. Now there are other types of nuclear battery that have been proposed and designed and partially tested and they include this design, the Toshiba 4S uh, reactor which is very different to that M-Power reactor in that the type of technology used is called uh, a fast spectrum reactor. And this allows for full recycling of the fuel. So I'm going to look now at what those fast spectrum reactors uh, are like, what typifies them and what are the important potential benefits of them. And it's really important to understand this because these type of fuel cycles are a way to make nuclear power inexhaustible and sustainable and probably much more publicly acceptable than traditional technology. They have a long history, they've been developed over the last 50 or so years, relatively little commercial deployment beyond first of a kind units in a few countries. The fundamentally biggest advantage is that they close the nuclear fuel cycle and I'll explain more about what I mean by that. So today when we mine uranium to power nuclear reactors, we mine it from the earth as some uranium oxide and then convert that to uranium metal. And that contains essentially two isotopes of uranium, uranium-238 and uranium-235. Now uranium-235 is the fissile isotope that can be uh, consumed in thermal reactors. Uh, but it's found at 0.7% naturally and so that needs to be enriched to 3 to 5% in order to produce usable fuel. As a result of this cycle, a large amount, around 85% of the mined uranium actually ends up never being used. Uh, that's called depleted uranium because it's been depleted in that fissile isotope. Of the remainder, which is manufactured into fuel rods, only a small proportion of that is actually fissioned and the rest becomes spent nuclear fuel or nuclear waste. So ultimately we end up getting less than 1% of the potential energy out of mined uranium as a result of these inefficiencies. So if we consider the, the mass flow for a typical light water reactor like we use today, it requires input of uranium ore and mined uranium. It produces a waste product, depleted uranium, it produces enriched fuel that is then used in the reactor. It comes out as spent fuel which requires disposal and typically because that spent fuel contains a mixture of um, heavy elements, actinides, uh, which many of which have long decay chains. It needs to be managed for long periods of time. Now it is possible to reprocess this fuel uh, to extract plutonium, which is one of the actinides that is produced in the reactor from uh, transmutation of uranium. Uh, to provide a little extra fuel, it ends up saving around 15% uranium by doing that. In France, for instance, they do that. But it ultimately has no impact on the lifetime you have to store the waste. So around 100 to 200,000 years before it would be considered to have decayed to the point where it's equivalent to natural uranium once again. Now the generation 4 technologies like the integral fast reactor and other designs you may have heard of, such as the liquid fluoride thorium reactor, are focused on a number of things, including safety and e economics, but also clearly on closing this fuel cycle. Now one big advantage of recycling the fuel is that you consume these transuranic elements, these actinides, over multiple cycles, which has two big advantages. One is you can generate enormous amounts of energy from them. And the second one is that it 
reduces the relative radio tox radiological toxicity of the fuel by orders of magnitude, and therefore the, the lifetime of the, the fuel uh, before it becomes less radioactive than natural uranium by orders of magnitude. Such that if you can fully extract the actinides, then you end up on this sort of decay pathway, which is the fission products, the combined fission products, and it crosses this threshold of being the same as natural uranium ore in about 300 years. So you take the problem of spent fuel management from essentially a philosophical one. How do you manage something for 100,000 years when humans as a species have probably only been around for that long? Through to a technical and engineering problem of how do you isolate a smaller amount of waste for 300 years? So that's a fundamental uh, change in the way you can perceive what is considered a major public perception problem with nuclear energy, and that's the extremely long lifespan of the waste. Now, a concept like the integral fast reactor, which has been developed at the engineering scale, uh, is that the fuel is run through a special type of reactor called a fast spectrum reactor, and then is recycled on site to extract the actinides, remove the fission products as a separate batch, and then to isolate those. And so this is illustrative of the process. I won't go through all of the details, but it includes extraction of the fuel into an, an electro-refining um, method which is able to separate the actinides from the fission products and then a reprocessing scheme to create new metal fuel which goes back into the reactor. And of course the reactor itself is like any typical uh, thermal reactor in that it creates a heat source which then has a heat exchanger to generate steam to produce the electricity that we want. So here I am standing in front of that demonstration unit in Idaho Falls or just outside of Idaho Falls, called the Experimental Breeder Reactor 2. So there I am, and there's a, some of the people who helped develop this technology. This is called the uh, Integral Fast Reactor Prototype, developed between 1984 and 1994. And this proved out many of the fundamental concepts behind um, a commercial fast reactor. So what is the Integral Fast Reactor? Well, it's probably best to describe it in terms of a compare and contrast with current generations of reactors, and it allows you to emphasise what are the, the advantages and disadvantages. So in current generation reactors, they tend to be cooled by water. Uh, there are gas-cooled reactors as well, but water tends to be the coolant medium. Whereas in the next generation IFR, it would be a liquid metal, so liquid sodium, which is reactive with water if it mixes, um, but is also a very good heat exchange mechanism and uh, is transparent to neutrons, which means the neutrons stay fast. So that's where that next line comes in, that water tends to slow neutrons down, which gives them a very large cross-section, but also means that the energy liberated in that uh, fission is, or well, the amount of neutrons liberated are much lower. So when you've got fast neutrons colliding with, uh, with fissile isotopes, you create enough additional neutrons to breed new fissile fuel. So that's why they're often called fast breeder reactors. Fast because the neutrons are fast, breeders because they breed new fuel. The fuel type in an IFR is a metal alloy rather than an oxide, and that has big advantages in terms of passive safety and recycling. And typically in a light water reactor, if you're going to recycle it, you need to use some aqueous form of plutonium separation that is not required in a fast reactor, in fact, a pyro process cannot separate plutonium from uranium and the other actinides. Now that has potential big advantages in terms of not producing the type of material that might be required to make a plutonium bomb. So here is a facility in Idaho Falls, where, uh, which was once part of the Argonne West National Laboratories, now part of the Idaho National Laboratories, where much of this technology and other similar technologies were developed. Around 50 reactor prototypes were actually developed at this site. And this was a reactor initially built in the 1960s, so it tends to have some of that funky sort of design architecture that, that uh, was popular back then. But it included a reactor building here and a recycle facility integral to the main uh, reactor. So that fuel was taken out of the reactor, trained along here to the recy remote recycle facility, and then taken back to the reactor. The type of fuel used in the integral fast reactor is a metal which is different to the type of fuel used in a typical thermal reactor today, which is an oxide, a ceramic. 
And the big advantage of metal fuels are that, uh, well, they allow a special type of recycling. They also have a number of thermal properties that give them great inherent safety. The big disadvantage historically had been that as you irradiate them, they tend to, and, and as they are burnt up, they tend to swell and produce fission gases, which causes the uh, fuel to burst its cladding. So it has a metal wrapping around the fuel as they swell like a balloon and eventually they burst the cladding and that causes all sorts of problems. What was found in the development of the uh, IFR was in fact that that swelling eventually ceases and as long as you've got some uh, bond around the fuel that is liquid like a sodium bond then eventually it reaches equilibrium. The swelling stops and instead of having one or two percent burn up you can reach 25 to 30 percent burn up which changes it from being essentially an unusable technology to a highly desirable one. The other big advantage is that as it heats up, for instance in an accident type conditions, because the fuel swells and it's also a metal which is highly conductive, it releases its thermal heat very rapidly and that means that it changes its neutronic properties so that neutrons leak out of the fuel to the point where it can no longer be critical. So the reactor can't run into a supercritical condition and because it's immersed in a sodium pool by natural convection it can cool itself. So many of the, react many of the accident conditions that are envisaged or have been demonstrated for thermal reactors can't happen in this sort of reactor according to the laws of physics. This is an example of irradiated uranium zirconium fuel and those bubbles there are the traces of the fission product gases, xenon and other gases that have been produced that tend to cause that swelling of the fuel. Well eventually there's enough interconnection of those pores that the gases are released from the surface up into the plenum and the swelling stops. So you can have high amounts of burn up. Another big advantage from a safety perspective is that there is much less stored uh, energy within the fuel because it's a much better conductor and so when you have transient conditions such as a loss of flow so that for instance the pumps have gone off and the coolant is no longer flowed around a heat exchanger uh, then the feedback mechanism is much shallower in a metal fuel than oxide fuel and it has big safety advantages. Now that's not just theoretical that has been proven in a number of demonstrations at uh, Argonne West in the mid-1980s, in 1986. They did two tests, one of which they cut off the pumps so that the coolant was no longer actively flowed and the reactor went through a reactivity spike as predicted and then declined to uh, a very low level of activity and cooled itself down. Then in the afternoon they did a second test where they did uh, a loss of uh, heat exchanger uh, accident the equivalent to something like uh, the Chernobyl accident and, uh, and once again it went through this initial reactivity spike and then down to equilibrium conditions. So many of the major problems that have faced that it require engineering solutions for current reactors uh, are inherent within this system as a safety system which is obviously very desirable. And then the metal fuel is essentially stays intact through very high burn up so it can uh, be maintained in a reactor for longer and that's potentially uh, very good from an economic standpoint. So by the time you've burned oxide fuel up to around 9% it looks pretty degraded in that picture whereas this is metal fuel at 12% and it's essentially very similar to what it looked like when it went in. Now metal fuel has another big advantage in that more than any other fuel type it is able to have a high breeding ratio and so that means it's able to produce more fissile material uh, for starting up new reactors than any other type of fuel. So if you want to expand your fleet of future fast reactors, a high breeding ratio is essential and metal best fulfills that role. This is uh, some of the detail of the way the fuel is, is um, processed and one of the things I want to underscore here is that it, it's set up to process metal fuel from the fast reactor through this pathway but you can also go through an intermediate step where you take the spent fuel from today's reactors, the oxide fuel, and reduce that fuel to a metal form and then create metal fuel for a fast reactor. The implication of that is that all of the nuclear waste that's been built up today from our current generation of reactors can be recycled into these reactors and consumed. So that it's not as though we build these new reactors and suddenly uh, 
the fuel from those is able to be recycled, all of the spent fuel that's been built up can potentially be recycled in these reactors. Now the IFR is a type of sodium cooled fast reactor and these have been developed and prototyped in many countries often with an astounding lack of success commercially. So there's been a number of countries that have had a sodium cooled fast reactor, none of them have except Russia have any sort of commercial design. The IFR program set out specifically to solve many of the problems that was holding back these conventional sodium cooled fast reactors. One of them was metal fuel as I talked about, getting that to work by allowing um, a sodium bond. Uh, big inherent safety uh, advantages over using the metal fuel. A very simple way of creating the fuel. Now for an oxide fuel it needs to be very finely milled and uh, doing that remotely is extremely challenging because these are very highly radioactive fuels uh, when they're going through the, the recycling procedure because they contain large amounts of uh, residual fission product. Uh, metal fuel can be injection cast, it's through a type of vacuum casting uh, to produce fuel pins that can be fairly crude because they're mounted in the cladding with a sodium bond so they don't need to be particularly well milled and this allows for very simple remote creation of the fuel. And this has been demonstrated at the Argonne Labs. Uh, now that is potentially a big impact in terms of the economics of recycling the fuel. So the annual mass flow for an integral fast reactor would be somewhere similar to the one I showed you earlier but also quite different because there's no, for instance, there's no uranium mining step here. In theory we've already mined enough uranium that's sitting around in depleted uranium stockpiles and spent fuel to power the whole world and these reactors uh, for around 500 years. So we've got plenty of fuel already available. We wouldn't need to resort to mining for many centuries. Uh, we reprocess the spent fuel from current generation reactors and then thereafter that is recycled through the reactors and a small input of around a ton per gigawatt of fresh uranium is then brought in to continue uh, the, the electricity generation process over the lifetime of the reactor. Now put simply that has a number of big implications. For instance you could take a hundred tons of spent nuclear fuel and you could choose to try and store it for 300,000 years however you may choose to define how to do that or you could run it through a pyroprocessing plant to produce around 100 tonnes of, well around 93 tonnes of, of um, reprocessed uranium, 2 tonnes of metal ingots, 5 tonnes of fission products, so all the fission products are removed and that reprocessed uranium can then be used as makeup for future fuel. So that 2 tonnes of metal fuel ingots is in, essentially enriched in actinized to the level where it can be used in a reactor and recycled and the rest of it here goes in as new fresh input as the fast reactors are running. Ultimately that boils down to a very concentrated form of energy such that a golf ball sized lump of uranium would be enough to power all of your energy needs for your entire lifetime. If you want the details that's on the basis of around 200 kilowatt hours per day per person for around 85 years of your lifespan which is an enormous amount of energy and that would include not just electricity obviously but the energy available to do things such as generating synthetic fuels to replace oil. And then your legacy of waste would then be a, a Coke can size amount of fission products that would be required to be managed for around 300 years. Now if you were to do that with something like coal, this is another interesting comparison, to get the same amount of energy out of coal, which is already a fairly concentrated chemical energy form uh, compared to that golf ball of uranium, you'd require around uh, 3,800 tonnes of coal which is like if, if an elephant was made out of coal, it would be like 800 elephants worth of coal. That's quite a lot and the coal's already concentrated. Now uh, I won't go through this in, in detail but uh, there are potential proliferation resistance benefits to this type of reactor as well. So often uh, people are reticent about fast reactors because they say well it creates a plutonium economy and it creates large amounts of plutonium that have to be recycled through the system. Isn't that a risk? Couldn't someone steal that plutonium and go off and create a bomb and, and cause all sorts of mischief? Well in fact the, the composition, equilibrium composition of the fuel is not really suitable at all for creating those sort of bombs um, in an IFR. One of the reasons is that it's not pure plutonium. The pyroprocess only produced some mixture of minor actinides and plutonium and uranium. No good for making a bomb. And of course it's not even 
isotopically of a suitable composition because it's a mixture of, of various isotopes of plutonium and other minor actinides rather than a high purity of plutonium-239, which is what's considered weapons grade. It's also got a lot of thermal power because there's various uh, fission products that are resident within the, the fuel that, uh, in trace amounts that are obviously very hot. So the thermal properties are around 80 to 100 watts per kilogram compared to 2 to 3 watts for weapons grade plutonium. So if you built some bomb out of this, it would have to be really heavily, uh, it would have all these radiative fins and so forth to try and cool the damn thing down. And the spontaneous neutrons, 300,000 neutrons per second per gram in IFR fuel, 60 in weapons grade uranium. So the chances of pre-ignition are very high if you tried to use this sort of uh, weapon. So overall, and also the gammas coming out of it, you know, talking about 200 rads per hour at half a metre, you wouldn't want to be handling this for that for too long. Uh, you know, maybe five seconds you could get away carrying it before you drop dead. So it's not really a very suitable material uh, for a would-be weapons producer. And interestingly, if you had an economy based on the IFR, uh, then there would be no more need for enrichment. And enrichment is, in fact, the simplest route to creating weapons, enrichment of uranium. And that would be immediately a flag that someone was using enrichment to create weapons because in an IFR cycle, there is no uranium enrichment required. Okay, this is all very well, an interesting technology, but there are many interesting technologies out there. Is it close to commercialisation? Well, it, it depends. It's not close in the sense of, in the next five years, it's not going to replace all of our coal-fired power stations, or indeed, it's not going to be the predominant type of nuclear technology that's built. But there are major steps in some countries to commercialise this technology rapidly. China is one of those. They have the Chinese Experimental Fast Reactor, uh, opened in 2010, generating electricity to the grid now. Essentially, they're running through various systems <clears throat> to test out uh, the feasibility, and then they'll move to build a, a 500 megawatt reactor as the next step. The Indians are also interested in this technology and are uh, in the late stages of construction of a 500 megawatt fast breeder reactor, which they hope to convert to metal fuels within about five years. The Russians have had considerable experience in these types of reactors. Different to the IFR, they're, they're traditional sodium called fast reactors, uh, but they are continuing to build those at a commercial scale and have sold a couple of those units to China. Now General Electric Hitachi have developed, on the basis of the IFR program, a commercial modular design called the S-PRISM, the Super Prism. And uh, this is an attempt by a commercial company to produce a commercial scale reactor, but it requires government support to deploy and demonstrate. But their ultimate uh, aim is to have a, a dual system of a reactor with all of the features I've talked about, um, combined with some method of either centralised or on-site recycling, to demonstrate this closed fuel cycle and its commercial viability. So um, I'll, I'll leave you to look at the slides afterwards to look at some of the promos that places like G Hitachi have produced. They're excited about this technology, but they're also principally focused right now on, on getting built third generation technology because um, that's where, in the short term, they think they'll make their money. OK, let's think for a moment about energy futures. So looking at, at the medium to long term. My view is that there will be some happy synergy between renewable energy and various types of nuclear. And really, this is the only way we're conceivably going to move away from fossil fuels in the sort of time frame I think is required, so in 50 to 80 years. <coughs> so this is Barry Brooks' vision of the future uh, in a low-carbon energy, where all of our energy comes from uh, non-carbon-emitting sources of energy. And not just electricity, but also enough energy to generate uh, synthetic fuels uh, for transport and so on, so to replace oil as well as electricity. And in this scenario, we have just over 50% nuclear electricity, nuclear energy worldwide, uh, around 25% wind and solar, and then a range of other technologies such as hydro, perhaps some fossil fuels with carbon capture and storage and some biomass and maybe other technologies like geothermal. To give you a sense of what would be required to get here, 
compared to where we are today. Obviously, there's no commercial CCS, so that may or may not ever become realised. To move to 52% of this future energy demand coming from nuclear, we'd need to increase our capacity by about 15 times compared to what we have today, which is obviously an enormous um, economic, technical and social issue to deal with. But of course, if you want to get that 25% share from wind and solar, then that would require a 50-fold increase in the amount of that capacity that we've built. So either way you look at it, um, ramping up these technologies will be an enormous challenge and a transformational one. <clears throat> so it's worth thinking critically about these pathways, which is what my research interest in this area is, and the relative plausibility, uh, depending on the features of the technology, their current costs, how their costs may change over time, and how it may interact with things such as carbon prices. So I won't now go through this in detail, but if you look at the slides afterwards, this is the breakdown of that scenario I showed in the slide. Now, in the, in the nuclear context, let's say we have that 50% of our energy coming from nuclear energy in the future. It won't all come from these Generation 4 technologies like the IFR. There will be a large amount of Generation 3 technologies that continues to be built over the next few decades. And I suspect there will be some synergy uh, of build-out where by about 2030, I think we'll be building a lot of these fast reactors, and by about 2050, I suspect that would be the only type of reactor we'd be building um, under my preferred scenario, but we would have a lot of legacy technologies that we would continue to, to run. And of course, all of the waste that's produced by those would be consumed by the fast reactors. So my vision for climate change is not that we somehow wind down industrial society to some pre-1750 state. I just don't think with a population size of, of seven plus billion uh, and the sort of expectations that most people have, that's, that's conceivable. So I think we do need to have an energy rich future, but one that is inherently sustainable. And that will include, I think, a large component of nuclear. Once we have abundant, and I would hope relatively low cost, low carbon electricity, a range of options really do open up. You know, the possibility of clean uh, desalination to, for instance, reduce our dependence on, on natural river systems. And that's been done with nuclear power, it's been done with solar thermal power, this sort of thing is possible. Generation of liquid fuels is obviously going to be fundamental to moving away from oil and gas. And uh, hydrogen has often been promoted as one of these technologies that could do that, perhaps so. Or perhaps hydrogen as a, as a base for various synthetic fuels such as ammonia or, or methanol if you have a carbon input, um, or hydrazine. These synthetic fuels that could be used to replace um, directly oil, and of course battery electric vehicles for many uses, and uh, there are even other potential options such as purified metals, aluminium, iron, boron, that could be combusted. Hydrogen is also a useful, uh, useful reductant for things like steel smelting as a replacement for carbon. There are a lot of possibilities if we start moving in this direction. And then not ignoring other parts of our society, such as waste. Um, there are other non-nuclear technologies that I think are, are really potentially very attractive, such as plasma arc torch technology, which instead of combusting waste, atomizes waste and is able to separate out metals and glass and, and various other chemicals to have a much more uh, recycled form of, of waste than we do today. Now, a final word on the socio-economic realities of any of these potential future technologies. Uh, one of them is that I think we need to look carefully at what has worked in the past as a way to judge what is possible. Now, you can choose any particular country for your technology or, or, or maybe a state, a city, some place where it has worked to its best potential and, and say, well, this is what is possible. For nuclear, the best comparison is France, which for various political and economic reasons chose to go down the nuclear pathway in the early 1970s, heavily dependent on hydro and oil-based technologies for electricity generation. The oil crisis struck in the early 1970s and the decision was made by the government to deploy a large amount of nuclear. So the first commercial unit, Fessenheim, opened in 1977, the 58th unit in 1999. So over a 22-year period, they built 58 uh, reactors which today meets just under 
of their electricity. And that was at the same time that total electricity demand grew by about two and a half fold. So they were building up to six new reactors per year, around 3.2 gigawatts, in an economy back in the 1970s that was around the same size as the Australian economy is today. So under that sort of basis, should we choose to do it, Australia could potentially displace all of its coal within a 20 to 30 year period with nuclear. Now there would be some lead in time before we'd have our first reactor, uh, so maybe a 30 year time frame. By 2050, it is a possible future. Now cost is obviously really important. I had a paper with some colleagues come out uh, this year in the journal Energy, uh, which looked at this issue as a meta review of a range of authoritative studies on the cost of electricity and the life cycle CO2 emissions uh, for those that were considered fit for service for replacing coal or other baseload generators. So for renewables that would include solar thermal with some form of storage or gas backup, uh, nuclear technology and potentially various carbon capture and storage with, uh, with fossil fuels. Now obviously the cheapest technologies are just using fossil fuels uh, by themselves and releasing the CO2 but they have very high emissions. For the low emissions technologies various carbon capture and storage and nuclear. The lowest emitter of those is nuclear and the lowest cost is nuclear right now. But of course that's only one measure of cost. It's not a measure for instance of the political or social acceptability of it. If you were to do something like apply a carbon price to these technologies and obviously those technologies that are highest carbon emitting will do worse under a rising carbon price and and those that are lower will do best, it turns out that by around $50 a tonne, about twice what we're proposing to introduce in Australia uh, next year, um, a range of carbon capture and storage technologies that potentially become commercially viable, around $50 a tonne. The global experience is that nuclear would be competitive at a far lower carbon price than that, and solar thermal uh, with traditional storage or gas backup would require around $150 a tonne carbon. Now the prices of those should reduce over time, it's, whether, it's a matter of whether that can do so rapidly enough um, and whether it can meet other criteria to displace fossil fuels. So that's uh, the end of my main talk, a few acknowledgements on some of the key people I work with in developing these energy future scenarios, some of which have been inherently involved in the development of the IFR technology such as uh, Chuck Till and Yoon Chang, John Sackett from the fuel cycle side. Len Koch here developed the very first reactor to deliver electricity to the grid. He's still around and actively interested in it. And then I have uh, my own website, blog site, where I talk about climate and energy issues called bravenewclimate.com. Uh, so you're welcome to log on there and, and um, see me rant about various topics of interest to me. Otherwise, I'm happy to take questions and thanks very much for your attention today. So in general that remains a question to be answered uh, by a demonstration of commercial technologies. You can look at first principles to try and understand where some of the additional costs would come from and where some of the cost subtractions would come from. So recycling the fuel is obviously an additional cost but the burden of disposal is changed and, and alleviated. Um, you don't need to supply fresh uranium so the cost of fuel is obviously reduced. The system itself requires a non-pressurised system that doesn't need a pressure vessel for instance and because it has many inherent safety features requires less engineering up front. So in potential this and other technologies like thorium technologies could have lower capital cost. Uh, 
that's the theory at least. Um, in practice it will have to be proven out at a commercial scale. But there's no fundamental reason to believe these technologies should be uh, more expensive than current nuclear technologies and they may well be cheaper. I would hope they're cheaper because I think uh, ultimately our best chance of displacing fossil fuels is unfortunately not going to lie in a global carbon price, it's going to lie in getting suitable technologies as cheap or cheaper than fossil fuel alternatives. If you can do that in fast reactors or even in current generation nuclear then I think we're a long way down that pathway to, to making it an economically sensible thing to displace coal. So in general, the, the reactor is set up either with a depleted uranium blanket around the core, which would absorb the vast majority of excess neutrons. And so the materials issue of the reactor vessel, which is not a pressurized vessel in itself, would be uh, reduced. Uh, you can put stainless steel reflectors also around the reactor core if you're not trying to breed the fuel. And they might have to be replaced every 10 years or so, but they can drastically limit neutron damage to the reactor vessel itself, such that the projected lifespan for them is on the order of a century or so. And the DBR2 ran for over 30 years and, and there was essentially no noticeable neutron damage to the reactor vessel. So yeah, th that's the sort of materials issues that can definitely be, can be um, engineered for. Uh, the thorium reactors follow a pathway where thorium-232 um, is bred into uranium-233 by neutrons and, uh, and then that uranium-233, which is also fissile, is then fissioned in the reactor. They have a, the, the most preferred design has a molten salt coolant, uh, which has very good thermal properties. Uh, it moderates to a degree, but there's also often a graphite moderator used, so it's run on a thermal spectrum rather than a fast spectrum. So it's not very efficient at consuming uh, existing nuclear waste, but, but potentially very easy to have a breakthrough, a break even fuel cycle and a big advantage is that it requires relatively little fissile material compared to a fast reactor to get it started as well. Uh, potentially very attractive technology and um, as was mentioned earlier by someone, um, it has online processing of the fuel and that could be important because the fission products can be removed as the reactor is, is um, being generated and, um, and that can make for a very efficient operation. Because it's a liquid fuel it obviously can't suffer a meltdown, it's already melted. So the safety features are that it drains away into some subsequent tank and, and cools itself down. So like the, the sodium-cooled fast reactor, it would have a number of great inherent safety features. I suspect it's 10 to 15 years behind technologically to the sodium-cooled fast reactor, uh, but also very promising technology. And places like China have announced that they're going to follow that research pathway as well as a number of others including pebble bed modular reactors and fast reactors to really prove out which they think is the most viable future option. I understand that the temperature at which these systems are run is a bit lower than coal systems. Well, sodium is essentially unreactive to the stainless steel and uh, the, interestingly when they drained the EBR2 reactor after 30 years they could still see the welding marks on the steel uh, so the sodium hadn't corroded it at all. Uh, the temperature uh, is lower because uh, the cladding um, actually forms a, a eutectic with the fuel at a temperature of above about 550 degrees Celsius so they tend to run them at an outlet temperature of about 510 Celsius to avoid that problem. Uh, interestingly, that's still hot enough to have quite high efficiencies of around, thermal efficiencies around 40%, and it's also high enough if you follow the copper chloride uh, thermochemical hydrogen production pathway as well. So the sulfur iodine pathway, for instance, requires around 800 degrees Celsius or so. This is a lower temperature pathway. So it, although they're not as hot as, as ultra-supercritical coal, for instance, they still have relatively high efficiencies and of course the fuel costs are essentially zero compared to coal and so the thermal efficiency itself isn't as paramount.
so, yeah, so the Super Phoenix reactor, it was just a sodium. It wasn't a, it wasn't a NAC coolant. Uh, but yeah, that, that leaked in its secondary system. So the way they work is they have a, a primary pool or primary loop and then a secondary non-radioactive sodium loop that then um, goes in an external building to the heat exchanger. And, um, and yeah, they had, they had leakage of the pipes there. Interestingly, in EBR2, they anticipated a lot of those problems from the start and uh, produced double walled piping. And over the 30 year life of the reactor never had a single leak. Whereas in, in Russia, for instance, the BN reactors had five or 10 leaks a year, for instance. They got them up and going again pretty quickly, but there are ways, if you spend a little more on the initial capital cost to essentially eliminate those problems. <laughs> yeah. Well, there are essentially two paths to producing fissile material for a weapon. One of those is to produce enriched uranium. Um, so if you switch to that pathway, then you would have to produce the enrichment facilities. Uh, now, you can do that whether or not you've got nuclear power or fast reactors or whatever. And as I said earlier, if you took that pathway um, and you only had sodium-cooled fast reactors with pyroprocessing, then it would obviously be for those sort of purposes. The alternative route is to produce isotopically pure plutonium. To do that, you need to chemically separate the plutonium as well as to have the right isotopic purity. So to produce the isotopic purity, you need to run the reactors on a short cycle, which if you have routine monitoring by an organisation like the International Atomic Energy Agency, would be very easy to detect. And the second one is then you need some form of aqueous reprocessing to chemically separate that plutonium from the rest of the fuel. And again, in an IFR world, there would be no need for those aqueous facilities. So again, that would be a signal for proliferation. Now, in, in the broader sense, Australia has as much proliferation potential as just about any other country that runs research reactors. I mean, a small research reactor that could be run clandestinely, separate out the plutonium, could in theory be used for that purpose. And having commercial power reactors is not going to change that much. Okay. It was a mixture of things. Uh, it, it was technological. That, Like any new technology, there are teething problems. And although a lot of fast reactors were built, you can think of the Phoenix and Super Phoenix and, uh, and the Borax technology in, um, in Russia. Uh, the British built the Dune Ray. Fast, and, and before that, actually, the, um, the, an earlier fast reactor. Uh, but essentially, they never moved beyond the first one or two increments of the design. And they never... Well, because we already knew how to build thermal reactors and there was no strong incentive to recycle the fuel or to do anything in particular about uh, the waste issue. There just wasn't a strong incentive then. And we knew how to commercialise thermal reactor technologies. The first commercial reactors were beached submarine reactors. They'd been built for that purpose to operate very efficiently and compactly and it was a technology that they knew. And so there was never a lot of interest in the large-scale commercialisation of the technology, and there was technological problems. Uh, it's like any sort of technology, you will have multiple failures before you hit upon the successful design. And my argument would be that something like the integral fast reactor is the successful prototype, and what we ought to be doing as a global society is taking a technology like that and half a dozen other promising technologies and demonstrating that at sufficient scale to prove out that. And I think you can do that with various renewable energy technologies, and various new design nuclear in international consortia to prove these out in a few places and then we'll know
our best to proceed. And I don't think that's been done adequately in fast reactors, just like in many other technologies. Well, for Australia, um, the energy minister came out last year and said we're going to require on the order of $100 billion of investment in just the replacement of our existing capacity within the next 10 to 15 years. It's a huge amount of investment. Globally, the World Energy Outlook suggested by 2030 around $26 trillion of investment required to maintain business as usual. So, as you say, any way you look at it, whether it be a fossil fuel intensive or some alternative pathway, uh, we can't avoid the fact that there's enormous investment. So even if these other pathways are projected to cost many trillions of dollars, yes, but are there, is that trillions of dollars more than what you would have to spend anyway? The answer is often no.